Hello everyone, my name is Brittany Wheely and I am the Youth and Community Outreach Specialist for Join Together Northern Nevada. JTNN is a substance abuse prevention coalition, so we partner with a lot of different agencies to promote a healthy and drug-free community. At the end of this presentation, don't forget to take the short quiz in order to get credit for uh, taking this, this short class. Uh, the quiz is about 10 questions long, and again, you do need to take it in order to uh, get a certification that you took this course. So we're gonna go ahead and dive in. So first we'll start out with what is marijuana? So you may have heard marijuana called by a lot of different names, but there are over 1,200 different names for marijuana. So marijuana is the dried leaves and flowers of the cannabis sativa or cannabis indica plant. Stronger forms of the drug include high potency strains like extracts, including hash oil, shatter, wax, dabs, and butter. So I've repeatedly heard the argument um, that because marijuana is a plant that it must be safe for you and it must be fine. Well, that's absolutely not the case. In fact, here are some examples of other plants that are in fact just plants, but do cause serious harm to humans. So poison oak is the first example. It can cause a bumpy rash that may form blisters and ooze. Foxglove, uh, this pretty flower is poisonous and can slow or disrupt your heart. And oleander, so all parts of the plant are very poisonous. Just one leaf is enough to kill an adult. Someone who ingests this may have serious stomach pain, diarrhea, vomiting, dilated pupils, dizziness, and breathing problems. So just because something occurs in nature does not make it safe. And the same is true for marijuana as well. Of the more than 500 chemicals in marijuana, yes, I said chemicals. Remember, this is not just a plant. Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol is known as THC, is responsible for many of the drug's mind-altering effects. It's the chemical that distorts how the mind perceives the world, or in other words, it's what makes a person high. The amount of THC in marijuana has increased over the past few decades. In the early 1990s, the average THC content in marijuana was less than 4%. It is now about 15% and it's much higher in some products such as oils and other extracts. Scientists do not yet know what this increase in potency means for a person's health, but there have been reports of people seeking help in the emergency rooms with symptoms, including nervousness, shaking and psychosis, or that having false thoughts or seeing or hearing things that aren't there after consuming these higher concentrations of THC. So smoking or vaping extracts and the resins from the marijuana plant with these high levels of THC is on the rise. There are several different forms of these extracts such as hash oil, butter, wax, and shatter. And these resins have three to five times more THC than the plant does itself. Smoking or vaping, also called dabbing, can deliver dangerous amounts of THC and has led some people to seek treatment in the emergency room. There have also been reports of people injured in fires and explosions caused by attempts to extract hash oil from marijuana leaves using butane. So again, this is not just a plant and especially when it's in this form, it's almost entirely a different drug. So here's a short video that we'll uh, watch that kind of talks about what happens to your brain when someone is using marijuana. For centuries, humans have been using substances to alter their state of mind, from caffeine, cigarettes, and alcohol, to more extreme drugs. But as the most commonly used illicit drug in North America, where does marijuana fit in, and how exactly does it affect your brain? First, we need to understand how the brain functions. Your neurons are the cells that process information in the brain. By releasing chemicals called neurotransmitters from the axon of one neuron to the dendrite of another, they change the electrical charge of the receiving neuron, consequently exciting or inhibiting it. If excited, the signal is passed on. Though it sounds simple, these signals work together and the effect is quickly compounded into complex configurations within milliseconds, flushing over the entire brain. This is what happens every single time you think, breathe, or move. So what's going on inside your brain when you're smoking marijuana? Well, unlike alcohol, which contains molecules nothing like those in our body, cannabis contains molecules that resemble those produced in our very own brains, cannabinoids. Though naturally, these cannabinoids circulate in much lower quantities compared to the large influx imposed by smoking. Specifically, the chemical tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, resembles a natural transmitter called anandamide. These cannabinoids are specialized neurotransmitters released by neurons having just fired. Neurons temporarily become unresponsive after firing to prevent them from overreacting or being too dominant. 
This allows your brain to function in a calm and controlled manner. But cannabinoids interrupt this approach in some parts of the brain. Instead, they remove the refractory period of neurons that are already active and cause your thoughts, imagination, and perception to utterly magnify itself. This means once you begin your train of thought, it becomes the most significant and profound thing ever. You can't see the big picture or even recall your last epiphany because you're caught up in the momentum of a particular idea and your neurons keep firing until a new idea takes hold and you go off on a new tangent. These cannabinoids also affect the levels of dopamine and norepinephrine in your brain, often leading to a sense of euphoria, relaxation, pain modulation, and general enhancement of an experience, though sometimes causing anxiety. Furthermore, there are cannabinoid receptors in areas controlling short-term memory, learning, coordination, movement control, and higher cognitive functions. Got a burning question you want answered? Ask it in the comments or on Facebook and Twitter, and subscribe for more weekly science videos. Okay, so as we saw in that video, um, this marijuana changes the way your brain works by affecting those neurons in the brain and changing the way they communicate with each other. So all, all drugs change the way the brain works by changing the way nerve cells communicate. Nerve cells called neurons send messages to each other by releasing chemicals called neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters attach to the molecules on the neurons called receptors. Drugs affect this signaling process. When, the marijuana, when marijuana is smoked or vaporized, THC quickly passes from the lungs into the bloodstream, which carries it to the organs through the body, including the brain. Its effects begin almost immediately and can last from one to three hours. This can affect decision-making, concentration, and memory for days after use, especially in people that smoke marijuana regularly. The same is true for people that smoke, vape, or um, use edibles of marijuana. Most of the cannabinoid receptors are found in parts of the brain that influence pleasure, memory, thinking, concentration, sensory and time perception, and coordinated movement. Marijuana activates the endocannabinoid system that causes the high and stimulates the release of dopamine in the brain's reward centers, reinforcing this behavior. Other effects include changes in perceptions and mood, lack of coordination, difficulty with thinking and problem solving, and disrupted learning and memory. So again, the marijuana will come into play and affect the brain uh, and how it creates dopamine. So because dopamine is that chemical that makes us feel happy and pleasurable. Anytime we introduce a drug into our brain that creates more dopamine, it's gonna reinforce us to wanna to use that drug over and over again. And your brain is especially important because it, as it continues to grow and develop during adolescence, anything you put into that brain changes it and makes it that you that much more likely to become addicted to it. And so this video kind of really uh, digs deep and explains how that happens. It's important to understand that everyone in the world has addictions, or rather natural addictions, to things that are good, like food, water, and sleep. These natural addictions are important for our health and survival, and without them, we would not hunger or crave the things we need to survive. Now, we aren't exactly born with these natural addictions. Our body creates them. Let's look at an example. When you bite into an apple, your brain says, yum. Your brain recognizes that this apple is good for you, it has nutrition, vitamins, and gives your body the energy it needs to survive. Whenever the brain recognizes something that's good, it releases a chemical called dopamine. Dopamine causes you to experience pleasure. It's what makes you feel good, like when biting into an apple. The brain releases this dopamine in order to teach the body that this is healthy and good for your survival, and that it should remember to do it again. Now, there are other things we do that can release the pleasurable dopamine like playing video games, exercising, or reading a good book. However, the amount of dopamine released during these activities is less than what's released when we eat food. The brain does this so it can recognize which is more important. So if you go two days without reading a book, or two days without eating food, your body is going to crave the food over the book. As such, your brain creates what's called a hierarchy of survival, which ranks how important each of these things is to your survival. Now, there are some things that will not cause the release of dopamine, like eating soap or punching yourself in the face. The brain knows that these things are not good and therefore does not release the pleasurable dopamine because your brain does not want you to do it again. Now, let's look at alcohol, marijuana, tobacco, and other drugs. These are all classified carcinogens proven to cause cancer and other fatal diseases. 
Now, your brain should recognize that these things are harmful to your body. However, these substances have special chemical characteristics that fool the brain into releasing dopamine, oftentimes in much greater amounts than the body has ever experienced before. Because of this, the body is fooled into thinking that these things are good and important, sometimes even more important than food, water, or sleep, and consequently hijacks the number one spot in your survival hierarchy. So now, if you go two days without eating or two days without drinking alcohol, your body will actually crave the alcohol over the food. This is an extreme case of addiction, where the person addicted believes that they will die if they don't get it. The severity of the addiction depends on where the alcohol or drug lies within your hierarchy of survival, and can increase even with casual use. Research shows that people under the age of 21 are at the highest risk of having their survival hierarchy hijacked. Why? because their brains are still growing and developing and are hypersensitive to false shocks of dopamine caused by these harmful substances. By 21, the brain is more fully developed and mature, and the survival hierarchy becomes more permanent and less susceptible to getting hijacked. The flip side is that once you are 21, it becomes very difficult to remove these harmful substances from your survival hierarchy. Studies show that 9 out of 10 people who currently struggle with addiction started drinking, smoking, or using before the age of 21. Understanding addiction as a preventable disease can help save millions of lives. The decision to wait until 21 could mean the difference between a life enslaved by addiction or a life full of success and accomplishment. Want to learn more? Visit us at wait21.org. Okay, so hopefully that illustrates a little bit better for you. Um, the effect that this dopamine has in our brain and also anything that alters that and heightens that state of dopamine can become uh, problematic for us, especially as our brains grow and develop. Uh, because as we are using these substances that create more dopamine in our brain, these substances like marijuana will kind of insert themselves into our hierarchy of needs, making us feel like we need this drug in order just to survive and thrive. So we have seen some correlation um, between teen drug use and brain size. So typically teens who use nicotine, alcohol, and marijuana have two brain areas of the brain that are, are smaller than average when they become adults. Those are the amygdala, which processes emotions. Um, this was smaller in people who reported greater use of those substances at age 12 to 15. So what that might look like on the outside is the person who struggles with their emotions. They may have anger issues or make decisions that are more driven by emotion rather than logic. The pars opercularis is in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, this was smaller in people who reported greater use of the substances at ages 16 to 18. The prefrontal cortex is sometimes called the CEO of the brain. It controls your ability to make smart decisions. How this might look on the outside is someone that might be making the same mistakes over and over again. Uh, they simply can't get their life together even when um, things are, keep going wrong. And it, those, those problems might seem pretty obvious to an outsider, but they just can't quite figure it out. So next, let's talk about what happens to your body when someone's using marijuana. So some of the short-term effects are shown here. We have altered senses, like, like seeing bright colors, altered sense of time, changes in mood, slow reaction time, problems with balance and coordination, increased appetite, trouble thinking and solving problems, memory problems, hallucinations, like seeing things that aren't really there, delusions, believing something that's not true, and psychosis, or having false thoughts. Uh, the risk for psychosis is highest with regular use of that high potency marijuana that we talked about a few slides ago. So those uh, THC extracts, which come in the form of dabs, um, butter, shatter, those types of things. Some more uh, long-term effects that you'll see when someone's using marijuana is an increased heart rate. So when someone uses marijuana, the heart rate uh, may increase or even double, especially if other drugs are being used with marijuana this can increase the risk of heart attack. We also have respiratory, uh, like lung and breathing problems. So smoke from marijuana irritates the lungs and can cause a chronic cough. These effects are similar to those from regular cigarettes. While research has not found a strong association between marijuana and lung cancer, many people who smoke marijuana also often smoke regular cigarettes, which do cause cancer. Uh, we also are seeing an increased risk for mental health problems. 
Marijuana use has been linked to depression and anxiety, as well as suicidal thoughts among teens. In addition, research suggests that smoking marijuana during the teen years might increase the risk for developing psychosis and people with a genetic risk for developing schizophrenia. So meaning if you have a history of mental illness, the marijuana use can bring to surface the surface that those mental illness, mental health issues. Researchers are still studying the relationship between these mental health problems and marijuana use. Uh, we also are seeing increased risk for problems for an unborn baby. So marijuana use during pregnancy is linked to lower birth weight and increased risk of behavioral problems in babies. So next let's talk about some of the other risks associated with marijuana use that are beyond just what happens to your brain and your body. So reduced school performance. Students who smoke marijuana tend to get lower grades and are more likely to drop out of high school than their peers who do not use. The effects of marijuana on attention, memory, and learning can last for days or sometimes weeks. We also see reduced life satisfaction. So research suggests that people who use marijuana regularly for a long time are less satisfied with their lives and have more problems with friends and family compared to people that do not use marijuana. Impaired driving. Marijuana affects a number of skills required for safe driving, like alertness, concentration, coordination, and reaction time. So it's not safe to drive high or to ride with someone using marijuana. Marijuana makes it hard to judge distances and react to signals and sounds on the road. High school seniors who smoke marijuana are two times more likely to receive a traffic ticket and 65% more likely to get into an accident than other teens. In 2017, 10.3% of 12th graders reported driving after using marijuana in the past two weeks. And combining marijuana with drinking, even in a small amount of alcohol, greatly increases, increases driving danger, even more so than using one or the other drug on its own. And also use of other drugs. Most young people who use marijuana do not always go on to use other drugs. However, those who use are more likely to use other drugs, other illegal drugs. It really isn't clear why some people go on to try other drugs, but research has found a few theories. The human brain continues to develop into the early 20s, and exposure to addictive substances, including marijuana, may cause changes to the developing brain that make other drug use more appealing. In addition, someone who uses marijuana is more likely to be in contact with people who use and sell other drugs, increasing the risk for being encouraged or tempted to try them. We've also seen studies uh, that have shown in rare cases, regular long-term marijuana use can lead some people to have cycles of severe nausea, vomiting, and dehydration, sometimes requiring visits to the emergency room. So now let's talk some more about marijuana and addiction. I often hear from people when I do these types of presentations uh, that marijuana is not addictive. However, that is simply not true. Uh, marijuana can be addictive, meaning that if someone will continue to use this drug despite its negative consequences and the effects it's having on, on their life. Approximately 10% of people who use marijuana may develop what is called as a marijuana use disorder, a problem with their health, school, friendships, family, or other conflicts in their life. A serious substance use disorder is commonly called an addiction. The person can't stop using the marijuana even though it gets in the way of their daily life. People who begin using marijuana before the age of 18 are four to seven times more likely than adults to develop a marijuana use disorder. So that means that if you start using marijuana as a teenager, you're more likely to become addicted to it than if you were, were to wait until the legal age of use. So if you're thinking about um, any friends or family that may have told you you're behaving differently for no apparent reason, um, such as maybe acting withdrawn, frequently tired or depressed or hostile, you should listen and ask yourself if they're right and be honest with yourself. These changes could be a sign that you may be developing a drug-related problem. Parents sometimes overlook signs, believing them to be normal parts of the teen years, but only you know for sure if you're developing a problem because of your drug use. Here are some of the signs. So things like hanging out with different friends, not caring about your appearance, getting worse grades in school, missing classes or skipping school, losing interest in your favorite activities, getting in trouble at school or with the law, having different eating or sleeping habits, 
having more problems with family members and friends. So these are all ways that you could recognize a marijuana use problem with either in yourself or within someone that you are close with. So this video illustrates what someone might go through as they develop an addiction. Okay, 
So in that video we saw in the beginning that Bird was really happy when he got a hold of that drug. Um, he then became more and more obsessed with getting that drug until it was the only thing that he cared about. Eventually the bird found himself unable to function or feel any satisfaction without that drug. And finally the bird was just found himself just using the drug just to feel even a slightly um, better than his current new state of normal. So that is also kind of illustrated here in this little graph I have for you. So when someone is, uh, you know, just not under the influence of any drugs at all, they're feeling fine and normal, um, they're at that, that normal baseline, which is that um, horizontal line that we see here. Um, but then say someone tries the drug for the first time, they're going to feel really excited and high and euphoric, and then they're going to kind of come crashing down uh, below normal. That's usually when someone kind of has those, those yucky hangover feelings, maybe being extra lethargic. Um, and then maybe they're going to try and use those drugs again. They're not always going to, they're not going to really ever get as high as they did the first time because now their brain is starting to adapt to that drug and regulate those levels of dopamine by providing less dopamine in your brain. Um, and then eventually you see someone getting high, crashing, getting high, crashing, and then eventually you see them starting to use that drug just to feel normal. So just to kind of maintain that normal baseline there that we have in the middle. And then eventually people will start to use these drugs just to kind of feel slightly less than awful, right? So in the picture that we have here, all the little emojis on the right-hand side, um, we have people that are crashing, they're coming down, feeling awful and terrible, um, in the pit of despair, in the throes of depression and things like that. So then they're trying to use these drugs to feel better and to feel normal again, but they really can't quite get there because their brain has become so altered that it's not able to um, produce the, that same level of high that they had in the first place. And it's also not able to regulate dopamine normally without the um, introduction of any substances. So if someone is dependent or addicted, they may be experiencing withdrawal symptoms if they stop using that drug all at once. Withdrawal can be very uncomfortable, which is part of what makes it hard for someone to stop using. You may have a mental image of a drug withdrawal based on a TV and movies, which includes uh, someone you know, curled up in a ball, sweating and shaking with unbearable discomfort and depression. These symptoms do occur in people that are addicted to drugs like opioids, alcohol, or cocaine. But marijuana symptoms, uh, marijuana withdrawal symptoms are often not as obvious as those for some other drugs, but they are still every bit as real. Some of the behavioral symptoms of marijuana withdrawal are going to be things like irritability, uh, feeling anxious or worried, feeling depressed, and being restless. This is where you'll also find a lot of people that say that they can't sleep without marijuana. Um, so that's an indication that they might be going through withdrawals. If they're not able to um, their body is not able to function the way it should without th this substance, that is a, is a sign of withdrawal. Um, some physical symptoms of withdrawal will also include things like stomach pain, sweatiness, shakiness, fever, chills, headache, having trouble sleeping at night and feeling tired during the day, having a low appetite or losing weight. So these effects can last for several days or to a few weeks after the drug use is stopped. Relapse or returning to the drug after you've quit is very common during this period because many people crave the drug to relieve these symptoms. People who use marijuana regularly may not realize that their symptoms could actually be part of withdrawal. One in 16s who try marijuana will get addicted to it, and that increases to as many as half of all teens who use it every single day. So I have a um, short video that I want to show for you. I was having a hard time getting it to embed into my slideshow. So let me just uh, take one second to make a new share. And we will see it here. A lot of us have an idea in our heads about what a person addicted to drugs looks like. But the truth is, anyone can become addicted to drugs. Addiction is when you feel a strong urge to keep taking a drug, even if it is causing harm. To stop, ask for help. Drug addiction doesn't depend on your income, your job, your age, race, or color. Addiction is a disease of the brain, and it can happen to anyone. 
you probably already know that you can become addicted to tobacco, alcohol, and illegal drugs. But even prescription drugs can be addictive when not taken as directed or when you take medication not prescribed for you. There are scientists who study drug abuse. Their research has taught us a lot about what makes you more likely to become addicted to drugs. Things like having family members who have had a drug problem, starting drugs at a young age, having mental health problems like depression, or hanging around other people who use drugs all put you at risk. But you do not become addicted if you don't take drugs. If you or someone you love has a problem, get help. And if you do become addicted, you can be treated and you can recover. Find drug treatment near you. Call 1-800-662-HELP. Want to learn more? Find easy-to-read drug facts at www.easyread.drugabuse.gov. Okay, so that video was from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Um, and it's, it's important to know that what causes one person to become addicted to marijuana um, while another does not depends on a lot of different factors, including things like their family history, the age they start using, and if they also use other drugs, maybe they're also their family friend relationships. So that if they hang out with a lot of people that use these types of drugs, they're more likely to use them as well. Um, and if they take part in positive activities like school or after school clubs or sports. So again, addiction to ha can happen to anyone at any age, but it usually starts when a person is young. If you continue to use drugs despite these harmful consequences, you could be addicted yourself. Okay, let's get back to our show here. So with all this talk about substance misuse and addiction, you may have questions about yourself or someone you know and how that you might know if they're at risk for drug or alcohol abuse. So here are a handful of questions and you can answer following yes or no for yourself again or someone you know, um, but it's important to answer them decisively. Keep in mind that if it's not immediately a no response, then it's probably a yes. There are no maybes in this exercise. So the first one is, have you ever ridden in a car driven by someone, including yourself, who was high or had been using alcohol or drugs? Do you ever use alcohol or drugs to relax, feel better about yourself, or to fit in? Do you ever use alcohol or drugs while you're by yourself? Do you ever forget things you did while using alcohol or drugs? Do your family or friends ever tell you that you should cut down on your drinking and drug use? Have you ever gotten into trouble while using alcohol or drugs? So if you've answered two or more of these questions with a yes, then you or someone you know may be at risk for substance abuse. It's never easy to have that conversation and talk to someone that you or they have a problem, but isn't that what friends would do? No one ever thinks that trying drugs is going to lead to a life-threatening addiction, yet millions of people find themselves dealing with this issue every single year. If your friend, you or your friends do one or more of the following, you should talk to them and also seek some, some guidance. And also keep in mind that addiction is not just a phase that people go through. It's an illness, uh, a disease of the brain that someone who's diagnosed with it will have for the rest of their life. They can manage it, um, but it will never really go away. So it might seem like marijuana is all around you and you may be wondering how you can avoid it. Oftentimes people start using marijuana because they're getting influenced by friends or they're trying to cope with stress or they didn't know how bad it could be for them. But hopefully um, when it comes to how bad marijuana is for you on your brain and body, hopefully you have a lot more information now. Um, but next we're gonna talk about ways we can uh, avoid marijuana use. So the first one is to be your own person. Don't let others influence you and the choices you make for your health. Just be yourself and hang with friends who encourage you to be who you are and not what they want you to be. Next, it's important to learn healthy ways to handle stress. Stress is a normal part of life, um, but how you learn to handle it makes a difference. 
Some people look to drugs as a shortcut, but they can often make the situation worse, causing even more stress, anxiety, or even depression. So here are some ways you can handle that stress. Know your limits. And know yourself and, why, and your limits so that you can anticipate stressful situations and be prepared. Find activities that help you diffuse stress, like exercise or meditation. Physical activities reduce the level of stress hormones in the body. Uh, take some breaks. They let yourself reset and recharge, plus you'll be more productive when you get back to work. Treat yourself right. Eat healthy and get plenty of sleep. Keep your friends close by. Socializing is a natural form of stress relief. Don't be afraid to ask for help. So asking for help doesn't necessarily mean you need to, to run out and tell everyone how stressed you are, if that, unless that's what you want to do. But asking for help so much as just, you know, calling a friend and saying, I need to vent for a little while. Or maybe asking um, a friend or a teacher or a coach or somebody on how you can help prioritize your time to reduce some of this stress. It's also important to do your own research and ask questions. So we get hit with media messages all the time promoting drug use in our society. We hear music, we see ads, we watch TV, we see clothing logos, we read, and we surf the web. But have you ever stopped to think about how many media messages you see each day or who's actually sending those messages and why? So ask yourself, where is this message coming from? Is this coming from a marijuana industry company? Is it coming from a teacher? Is it coming from a friend? Um, when we're listening to um, different forms of media, ask what is this song? What is this website? What is this article? Or any other messages? What are they trying to tell me here? Are they promoting marijuana use as a fun and healthy active lifestyle? Or are they saying that it's bad for you? Um, what's the point of view of the person sending this message? So is the person that's communicating to you, are they someone that, um, you know, gets really good grades and has um, a lot of opinions and facts and th facts to back them up? Or is it someone that smokes weed every day and says that it's fine because they do it? Um, ask, how is that person sending this message trying to make you feel? Are they trying to make you feel smart or stupid? Um, are they trying to make you feel like you don't know what you're talking about? It's okay for you to take a, a minute and get away from that conversation and do your own research. Um, and then also what kind of research or data is this message based on? Again, is this, um, you know, someone telling you that marijuana is not addictive and, you know, that it's fine for you? Or is that someone that smokes weed every day or is that from, some from a scientist? Um, because all of our scientific research will indicate that Smoking marijuana can cause harm for your brain and your body. And these effects can be long-term, especially if you're starting at such a younger age. So next we wanna talk about some refusal skills. So even when you're confident in your decision to not use drugs or alcohol, it can still be hard when your friends are the ones that are offering it to you. A lot of times a simple no thanks may be enough, but sometimes it's not. And it can get intense, especially if the people who want you to join on, on this bad idea feel like you're judging them. So here are some ways that you can refuse these, these substances um, and maybe save face a little bit and try not to hurt anyone's feelings. So you can offer to be the designated driver. You can get your friends home safely and everyone will be glad you did not drink or take drugs. If you're on a sports team, you can say you're staying healthy to maximize your athletic performance. You can always say that you have to study for a test, go to a concert, visit your grandmother, babysit, march in a parade. Realistically, insert any handy excuse here will do. And that you can't do that after a night of drinking and doing drugs. Again, the effects of marijuana um, can last up to days or sometimes weeks. Also, finding something else to do so that you look busy. Uh, if you're at a party with a bunch of friends, um, try something like getting up and dance or if you feel like you're not the best dancer or a little self-conscious about that, that's okay. Offer to be the DJ, just make yourself look busy. People aren't gonna um, try and pull you away from what you're doing just to do drugs. And then when all else fails, blame your parents. Explain that your parents are strict or that they'll check up on you when you get home and that there's no way you can come home high and be convincing. And then lastly, I wanna just talk about where you can find some more information and resources. So that way you can do some of your own research and make sure that you're getting some quality sources in. 
So with that, we're going to um, dig in. I have a few suggestions here for you. So jtn.org, teens.drugabuse.gov, cdc.gov, samsa.gov slash marijuana, justthinktwice.gov, and abovetheinfluence.com. So let's take a look at some of those resources. Do a new share. And I had them queued up and ready to go for us. So the first one is jtnn.org. So J, JTNN is joined together in Northern Nevada. That's the organization that I work for. Um, but here we have a lot of resources for um, especially young people and how you can kind of make your own decision that's based on facts and things like that about the substances before you try them. So here we'll go to resources. Actually, I didn't want to go to resources. Um, I would like to go to drug information. So go to drug information. And here you'll find some information about just all kinds of drugs. So we have alcohol, bath salt, cocaine, vaping, marijuana, so all of these things here. So I'm gonna go ahead and click marijuana since that's what we're talking about today. And here we have things about the growing brain. Um, as I was telling you that your brain is still growing and developing until you're 25. And then it's important to try and keep these addictive substances away from your brain during that, especially during that time. Um, all of these articles uh, have sources that are cited. So you know that these are coming from reputable places, uh, not just you know people that hate marijuana, but actually scientists and um, government officials. And then if we go back, if we go back to our youth section, we also have that resources page as well. Let's take a look at that. Apologize, this site seems to be loading a little bit slowly. But yeah, here, so here we have some resources, whether it's, um, you know, videos from our Speak Out students. Um, we have uh, resources that says, now that you're 18, what are the laws and how are they going to apply to you? Um, and then also some other websites that you can uh, take a look at as well. So the next one I want to look at is um, teens.drugabuse.gov. So this is a website that's put together from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And it has a lot of different articles and things like that about teenagers and substance misuse and, and the substances that are out there right now. Um, so here we have activities. What are the signs of, of having a problem with drugs? So a lot of different activities and articles that you can take a look at. Again, they have more drug facts. So if you want to um, cross-reference the stuff that was on the JTN website with the stuff that's on this website, I definitely encourage you to go ahead and do so because you know um, it's important for you to have research from multiple credible sources. Um, so again, here we have you know just information on marijuana use. Um, and then if you're interested, we have more resources on the brain and addiction. Kind of talks about how your brain is forming um, and it's you know how it works and things like that and how drugs affect your brain. Uh, the next one we have is the cdc.gov. So this is a Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So right now on, I'm on the, the landing page here. And as you can see, there's a lot of information about COVID-19. But um, let's go ahead and type in the search box here, marijuana, and see what comes up. Um, so yeah, here we have, is it you know possible to overdose or have a bad reaction to marijuana? We have marijuana and public health. So let's go ahead and click the first one that we have here and see what we have. Um, here we have some FAQs, so you can kind of get answers to some of those frequently asked questions. Um, so what determines how marijuana affects a person? That seems like a good, good question. And again, here we have some of these answers that, like any other drug, marijuana's effects on a person depends on a number of factors, including their previous, previous experiments with drugs or experience with drugs, biology, so again, their genes, if, if addiction runs in their family, how the drug is taken, gender, and how strong it is. So it just really depends on a lot of different things. Um, and then how about here, is it possible to overdose? So again, a fatal overdose is unlikely, but there are usually signs of overdose and that would typically be the, those um, extreme psychosis, um, confusion, anxiety, and things like that, fast heart rate. 
So next we have um, SAMHSA.gov slash marijuana. So SAMHSA is the acronym for Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. So again, this is part of the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, so they have here just some marijuana facts, um, know the risks of marijuana. And again, here we have that quote that we talked about in our presentation, approximately one in 10 people who use marijuana will become addicted. And then when they start before the age 18, the rate of addiction rises to one in six. So um, the earlier you start using marijuana, the more likely you are to become addicted. That's why we have laws in place that um, delay marijuana use for young people. And that's why that, that legal marijuana um, purchasing age is 21 years old. And then next we have justthinktwice.gov. Um, they have just kind of a scrolling bar here of a handful of different questions like on vaping and things like that. Um, I'm kind of intrigued by this first question. Um, how many drugs does it take to become addicted? So let's take, take a look at that story. Um, so how many drugs does it take to become addicted? So although we know what happens to the brain when someone becomes addicted, we can't predict how many times a person must use a drug before that happens. The only way to be sure a person will never become addicted is if they don't use it. So again, prevention is um, the best way to avoid, is, is to avoid getting addicted is to not using, use addictive substances. So again, um, here we have some more information about what influences whether someone will get addiction. Again, the same things that we talked about in our presentation, also the same things that we saw on the CDC website, that their genes, their environment, whether their friends and family use drugs. So these all play a role in whether or not someone becomes addicted to drugs. But again, the number one way you can prevent um, drug addiction is by not doing drugs. And then lastly, we have um, Above the Influence. Um, so this one is a website that uh, talks about just kind of drugs in general and how it's important for young people to just live above the influence of drug use and peer pressure. Um, so let's take a look at the know the facts section and take a look at some of the drug facts. Um, so here we'll have just, again, some more articles on just different drugs and things like that. Um, here again, we have that statistic that 90% of Americans with a substance abuse problem started smoking, drinking, or using drugs before the age of 18. That's that one in 10 number that we just talked about in our last, the last, uh, website we saw as well as in our presentation. So here you are seeing it in several different places. And so you can kind of know that this is a factual piece of information. So um, again, the earlier someone starts using these drugs, the more likely they are to become a, um, to develop a substance misuse problem. Um, so with that, we'll go back to our presentation. Hopefully those were helpful resources for you and you can kind of dig into if you are looking for more information. Um, and just to wrap it up, again, my name is Brittany Wheely. I am the Youth and Community Outreach Specialist at Joining Together Northern Nevada. Um, if you have any other questions, you can reach out to me. My email address is outreach at jtnn.org. Or you can catch me on my office line, which is 775-324-7557. And before I um, dismiss you all for today, I wanted to remind you that there is a short quiz that you will need to take and pass in order to get credit for this um, this presentation. So don't forget to click on that link on the page that where you found this presentation. And with that, I will let you all go and I hope you have a great rest of your day and um, stay away from marijuana, obviously, and try your best to live a, a healthy and drug-free lifestyle.